It's a little bit exciting. So this is our final lecture recording for this subject, which is a bit scary, eh? Let's come up quick. Okay, so we're going to talk here about alternative remedies. Um, alternative remedies being all of the bits that aren't damages or specific performance. I haven't used this as a technical term. This is just a collection of all of the above. So I'm going to talk about these. And to be honest, this stuff is actually pretty relevant. Uh, these, these concepts are useful to know. They're going to be useful in other areas of your um, legal academic times, your time at university. They will be useful in practice. Um, these, even though some of these rules are old, they seem a little uh, old school, they are relevant and they are useful. Because when we've been learning all of these um, doctrines and principles of contract law, and our total failure of consideration and breach and so on like that, and um, particularly doing the vitiating factors, contracts were void ab initio, um, where there is no contract. Well, what happens if money's been paid? What happens if stuff's been transferred? What do you go and do? And the, um, the default rule that Ra both Rachel or Steve Rohr or myself would have is that I'll oh, use other areas of law to get that stuff back or to seek some remedy. And so this is the, essentially, those other areas of law that we're going to use to get some result. But we're going to start with looking at uh, injunctions. Now, injunctions are kind of a, um, uh, they're very similar to specific performance in that they're, injunctions are granted in equities jurisdiction. And so all of the rules to do with unclean hands, delay, not assisting a volunteer, all of the, those principles of equity that you'll do as part of a, or, um, your stage three subject are going to apply. And it's nice because the rules for uh, substantial performance apply uh, essentially the same way. But there's a couple of key distinctions um, that we need to make here. The injunctions come in two flavors. They are injunctions as we commonly know, which is stopping or prohibiting conduct stopping a person and this can be often in contract law it'll be um, parties of the contract but can actually extend to third parties um, the use of injunctions as a discretionary remedy in equity has a wide vast reaching effect we talk about injunctions in other aspects of commercial law we use injunctions in tort to prevent some form of injustice um, again, lean again meets and so on. And we use them in administrative law, injunctions against decision makers from doing things. So this, this area comes up a lot. It is worthwhile using these provisions um, and learning how they work, not provisions, sorry, these rules and principles. But the couple of key things we need to note here is that by far the overwhelmingly most common type of injunction is pro, pro can't pronounce it very well. Prohibitory, that is stopping people from doing something. And if they carry on doing the thing, it's contempt of court and they can go to jail. And you're personally held liable for that if you breach an injunction. Uh, but the other type, which happens much, much rare, more rarely, is a mandatory injunction. That is to make somebody do something. And there was a good question before to do with specific performance because making somebody do something sounds like specific performance and in many ways it is. There is one key difference though. A mandatory injunction makes a person do a specific thing. So it could be granted in a situation where you only want to enforce part of a contract. So again, with this a contract where there's a personal service as well as a unique item, there's one contract, a mandatory injunction could force that party to, uh, to produce or convey the unique item in situations where they know they can't get an order for specific performance because it involves personal service. Um, that's one mechanism or way around that. But Certainly here, that's probably all I'll mention of mandatory injunctions. That's the very, very narrow set of facts that'll come up in. Um, we'll talk about uh, some of these cases again, um, uh, injunctions involving um, restraint of trade, 
clauses because these things do come up. Um, Curro and Beyond Production is, um, there's a woman called Tracy Curro, who I believe was a TV person in Australia in the 90s. Not being in living in Australia in the 90s, I, I can't corroborate or confirm that. Apparently, she had a show called Beyond 2000. It was a bit of a silly name for a show in 2019. But she wanted to go and switch networks um, from nine to seven, I think. And they went to seek an injunction preventing her from doing that. Um, and the courts granted it. Uh, they said that the conduct in this particular situation warranted her going through and doing it. But again, we go through and look at the rules and principles of equity. Is this going to cause some form of hardship? Is this going to um, lead to some grave injustice? Is this going to somehow, in any other way, offend the principles of equity as a court of conscience? These are things we look at when we're determining whether or not injunctions get granted. So here's some terminology. Um, and again, this is really for your um, for your own um, for your own benefit because you're going to have this area of law is going to come up a few times in your legal education. An interlocutory injunction is one which is granted early on. So usually, when something really bad is about to happen, if you don't get an injunction to stop it, there's no point going all the way to trial. Um, this happens, for example when um, a TV crew has come onto your premises and has completely unlawfully obtained information and is about to go and broadcast it. Um, an interlocutory injunction can be granted at a very, very, with a very minimal set of information um, without the benefits of a full trial in order to preserve the positions of the parties before the trial happens, which, as we all know, in the legal system, can be a long time after the fact. Because the parties have got to go and induce evidence. They've got to go and find um, all of their expert witnesses. They have to develop their argument. These things take time and money. And so this idea of an interlocutory injunction can be done at a very early stage. Um, an interim injunction is one which is periodic, that lasts for a length of time, uh, will last until something happens, a set of circumstances happen. Um, uh, a kia timet injunction is where there is going, or it looks like there's going to be some form of breach. Um, it's an injunction that can be awarded, preventing one side from doing things in a certain set of circumstances where it looks like they're going to breach the contract. Okay, so a lot of the, the um, principles that I talked about in regards to specific performance apply here. That um, the idea of equity being a court of conscience, equity only doing the minimum that it can to um, give justice to the situation, um, and equity needing to intervene when common law damages are inadequate. All of these situations are going to apply in regards to injunctions in contract law. Um, but one of the particular areas that we need to look at is this idea of uh, restraint of trait clauses. These are important because, uh, again, these can come up. And we use these principles uh, involving injunctions in situations where people are going off and doing, um, doing their own thing. Um, Lanley and, and Wagner I talked about earlier, that was the opera singer, and, and Tracy Curra and beyond. Now, Warner Brothers Pictures and Nelson is actually his own. I don't know, just as a piece of trivia, who the person called Nelson is. Um, her stage name, stage name, acting name was, was Betty Davis. Um, so the, um, the actress Betty Davis went to the UK. Um, she was under contract in, with Warner Brothers in the US. You cannot go and perform in movies for any of our competitors anywhere. She came to the UK and tried to basically film, um, go in some films. And Warner Brothers went to try and take out an injunction to try and restrain her. Okay, so they tried to restrain her and they succeeded. Why? Well, for a variety of reasons. One is that the clause was fair and reasonable. Another one was that she wasn't going to suffer any undue hardship. 
Um, another was that she could still go and do things other than movies. Not that she could just go and flip burgers or do what the equivalent was in the 1930s. Um, she could still go on stage. She could still tour. She could still do other things and appear and promote things in other ways. She wasn't going to starve. It wasn't going to cause hardship to her. She'd entered into a fair and reasonable contract and she'd been paid an appropriate amount for that for them putting that restrictive trade clause in there. Okay, so that's um, something to just note there. That the courts, well, you know, we don't like doing things, stopping people, stopping citizens from doing things. We also appreciate that people do enter into contracts and, and they receive consideration, valuable consideration for doing so. Um, okay, but the flip side of that, we also don't make people um, we don't want to use the courts, particularly not in, in the equitable jurisdiction, to essentially make people um, specifically perform things for personal service. Um, and so, page one records in Britain. Britain, um, this case involved a band. Um, uh, in all fairness, I expect there's about three people in the room know who this band is. They were called the Trogs. The Trogs, yeah, I thought you did. Yeah. Um, it's a generational thing there. What's the year on this? 1968. The Trogs had a hit song um, called Wild Thing back in the 60s. It was, it was a god awful song. Go and YouTube it at some stage if you want about 30 seconds worth of confusion. Um, and they had a manager. They had a manager, and the, the manager, they. Um, had a falling out with the manager. The manager had a contract for, I think, four years to essentially act as manager for this band. And they had a falling out, and so they wanted to get someone else. And management stepped in, and this is the page one record, this is the management um, entity, and said that, no, we, um, we have an exclusive right to be your manager, and we want to enforce that right. And the courts, were, they analysed this. It was actually a little bit, um, a bit tricky for a couple of reasons. One is that, again, we don't want people to be forced to work with other people. So while you, you don't want to be forced to be an employee, you don't want to be forced as an employer to take employees. Neither of those things are desirable. It doesn't fit into our legal system. Um, but here was a slightly tricky situation because the, this band of miscreants, by their own admission, were hopeless. And they couldn't effectively perform without a manager. And so in this situation, um, while they can't grant an injunction, forcing them, um, sorry, they, would ref they refuse to grant an injunction, preventing them from getting another manager, because that completely undermined their ability to operate as a band. They were useless, again, by their own admission. All right, by their own admission and the admission of the person trying to seek the injunction. So that in that situation, look, that's not going to work. So that we can't get an injunction preventing the trogs from getting another manager. You're just going to get dollars instead. Um, and again, we'll come back to that. There's Lord Kanzak dollars. Uh, Buckenara and Hawthorne um, was a player for the Hawthorne Football Club who wanted to go somewhere else, and um, Hawthorne sought to restrain them and succeeded. Um, you can go and play for whoever you want, provided they're not one of the Victorian VFL teams, not one of our competitors. And uh, we... Um, we can't force you to play for us, but we can stop you from playing for our competitors. Right. So when making this, um, when seeking an injunction to uphold a restraint of trade clause, uh, these are the things the courts look at. Um, the length of what's created. So. Um, here at this negative covenant, 
is a restrictive train clause. It's preventing a side, one of the parties, from doing something. Um, and so that this, we, you know, we look at how long it's for, we look at the, under, the fundamental nature of it, whether it's going to um, again create some form of injustice, whether or not it's, um, it requires the parties to have to deal with each other when they clearly don't want to. Um, and this aspect of compulsion, is it in substance actually forcing the parties to continue with the relationship that they have? In other words, where you've got a relationship between two parties acting as a manager for a band or employee, employer, or a football player for a club, right, is granting the injunction, stopping them from going elsewhere, essentially in form and function, in substance and in effect, stopping them, or essentially making them have to stay with you. Because if that's what's going to happen, we aren't going to grant it. You'll still get a remedy, but it's not going to be an injunction. We don't like unduly restricting people. Um, it's not cool in our legal system. It's not the done thing. So that's kind of it for injunctions. Um, just you need to just leave in the back of your mind that they are an equitable remedy, and that they're not granted lightly. Um, in the situation where it does come up in contract law, is this restraint of trade? Uh, clauses, but they do pop up in a variety of other areas of law that you'll be exposed to at some stage later in your degree. Okay. This next slide is to do with what's called Lord Cairns Act damages. Um, these, are a, these are a tricky thing. And the reason I say that is that equity never had the jurisdiction to grant damages. It just didn't. You could get a variety of other remedies, specific performance, an injunction, rescission, but you couldn't get equitable, you couldn't get dollars straight up. If you wanted dollars, you had to walk across the courtyard and lodge your case in the courts of common law, which seems a little bit strange to us now. And if you went back and looked at it, it probably was strange back then too. These two completely separate legal systems. And one of the frustrating things is that what that meant is that you had to start again. You actually had to go start your action again in the other courts if, you, if for whatever reason the equitable remedy couldn't be granted, which is a real problem for things like specific performance. Why? Well, the subject matter has been destroyed. There's no mechanism for the courts of chancery to actually award damages instead. And so Parliament intervened um, in the, it's in the 1800s, this Lord Kenzak, giving, essentially giving the courts the power to do this. It happened about the same time as what they call the fusion of the courts of chancery and the courts of common law together. So it's in one courthouse, one physical location, one physical group of judges that administer it or decide, use it, interpret the law, even though the two sets of legal principles still remain separate and distinct. So this is a, a, um, a statutory framework. In situations where you can't get an injunction or you can't get a um, specific performance for a variety of tasks. Um, again, you can't get specific performance, the assets disappear. You can't get an injunction because it um, creates some sort of hardship. As a result, you can just, through the statutory mechanism, be awarded damages. And I, I say this reluctantly because in situations where I've gone through and um, both looked at the work of grads, but also gone through and marked these, um, these sorts of pieces, you, you don't usually get equitable damages, full stop. It's actually a pretty rare set of circumstances the courts award dollar value in the context of what we would consider to be compensation. It's not really how equity works. Equity, remember, is supposed to remedy defects in the common law. If common law damages are adequate, you get common law damages. It's only a rare set of circumstances, one of which is when, in order for specific performance, for whatever reason, 
um, can't be completed. You can get them in situations where there is an order for an injunction or specific performance, and it needs to have something else as part of that. So it's essentially, it's a, it piggybacks on the top of an order for one of those aspects of equity. But it's rare to get them on their own. Um, and that's just really the way that equity sits. Something has to have fallen through somehow um, in order to receive uh, equitable damages. Um, you have been exposed to this though already though, um, because it can happen in things like estoppel. Uh, here this um, Walter Stores in Maya, is a case you guys would have done in contract in LA 1105. Um, so it did, it did go through and they mapped it out in that situation. All right, that's the end of the well, kind of the equitable stuff, kind of. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of what we call the quasi um, quasi contractual remedies. Um, I've alluded to this a few times. Uh, this idea of the doctrine of quantum merit. Uh, if you go back through um, you know, previous versions of the subject, sometimes Steve or Rachel would talk about it earlier in the subject, I've left it to the very end um, intentionally uh, to really talk about how this works. Um, this does come up, by the way, it comes up in practice. Um, we use the phrase quasi-contractual remedy. It is still discretionary. Um, arguably, it's not an equitable remedy. It's really a common law one, um, but it's still discretionary. Mm, go figure. And it basically works like this. If work has been done, and this, by this I really mean a, in a common sense, in a lay person sense, if somebody's done work, all right, but for whatever reason, there's no contract, either because the formalities haven't been met, one of the elements is defective, um, or there's the arrangement was one whereby we would agree on stuff now and then put it in a contract later. Um, you guys would have been exposed to the rule in, in Masters and Cameron, agreeing to agree later. Um, so in some of these situations, the courts, and I, I've made this comment probably several times in shoots, courts tend to interpret things towards people being paid, particularly uh, builders, subcontractors, laborers, people fairly and reasonably exerting their own physical labor, producing things, creating things, doing things, and expending their own materials to go through and do those things. All right. It creates a real problem if others can rely on strict sort of common law rights. Oh no, there was no formal contract because of some particular reason, the legality, um, or some statutory rule that prevented them, uh, the two contracts from meeting, or, or one of the elements was somehow um, defective in some way. So that one of the remedies the courts use quite commonly is this idea of quantum merit. Um, the High Court talked about it relatively recently, about 10 years ago, in that Lumbers case. The key thing to note, which came from Lumbers, is that something that looks very similar to a contract must exist. You can't just turn up to someone's house, start working on their garden, and expect to be paid. Um, and this operates different and distinctly from estoppel. Remember in estoppel, Walton Stores last semester, we had this idea of, um, that there was some form of detrimental reliance on a promise that was made it has its own series of elements. One party is, has taken that promise, accepted it, materially altered their position. It would be unconscionable for the other side to, to retain some sort of benefit. That's an equitable set of rules and principles. Um, here, this is to do with contracts for, but for whatever reason are either informal and never actually managed to be fully enshrined in, a, in an instrument things that didn't fully develop in the contract, but one or both sides have started working. And it's gonna create some problem if they're not being paid. Courts like people to be paid. 
And that's what quantum merit is. And so in Lumbers, the courts, the high court went through and said, look, this really only operates in situations where it looks like there was a contract. Or looks like there was a, some sort of solid agreement. It's not really about some broad principle of making sure people always get paid. Something has to look like a contract. It can be an informal arrangement that might, again, for example, the intention to create legal relations might have fallen below the threshold for a person to formally and officially sue for common law damages. But a reasonable amount can still be awarded by the court as much as was earned. Um, and so that when we're thinking about that, that's usually award rates. If you're thinking about labour, sure, if you had a contract, you'd be paid $50 an hour. If you didn't have a contract, there was a defect in it, you can still be paid for your time, but you're going to be paid at whatever the minimum is, the minimum for that particular industry, award wise, which I don't know for labourers might be, might be minimum wage, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, another thing to note, we talked about this doctrine of um, accept, accepting, voluntary accepting of partial performance. It's also known as the rule in sumpter and hedges. So the rule in sumpter and hedges, in situations where one person has done work and then abandoned the contract. One of the, um, the key uh, points that they made in sumpter and hedges is that if one side abandons the contract and the other side um, voluntarily accepts that, then they can recover some amount for what's been voluntarily accepted all right, some stage later. So Sumter and Hedges was exactly that. A builder um, entered into a contract, abandoned the contract, they're in breach. The other guy came back. Um, some stage later, he came back and asked for some money. And the court said that, look, in situations where the, uh, the, the innocent party, the one that hasn't abandoned it, in situations where they have voluntarily accepted the fruits of your labor and your materials, and in that situation, carried on building the house, you can seek some form of remedy, all right? But it's not common law damages, and it's not quantum merit. It's the amount, whatever the thing is worth, an equitable remedy in Sumter and Hedges is the doctrine of part partial performance. Okay, if you abandon a contract, if you're in breach, there is a contract, you abandon it, you can't ask for quantum merit to, to be paid for that, for the work that you've reasonably done. You've got to use some other area of law for doing that. We don't want to encourage people to half perform contracts. Do what you promised to do um, and receive the full benefit of the contract. Don't do a little bit thinking you're going to be paid a reasonable amount. That's not what we want to do policy-wise. So that's quantum merit. And the very last slide for this subject is in restitution. So restitution um, that is where money has been paid in error. You can ask the courts in situations where money has passed to another side, in situations where there is either some, like a total failure of consideration, or I might actually add here to this slide here, um, mistake, common mistake. If you manage to prove that contract is void ab initio, if money has been transferred, you can ask for that money back. And this is the mechanism you use to do it. Um, and so that, that uh, in fibrosa, I was asked we talked about involving frustration and total failure of consideration. So that phrase you probably need to tuck in the back of your mind as well. Because you can ask the courts to seek restitution. This, this is a particular um, action you can take to ask for the repayment of money if there's been some error, if there's no contract, or there's been some a total failure of consideration by one side in that contract. 
What that means is that you're bypassing all of the rules for breach and damages. Bypassing the, the principle of Robinson and Harmon. You don't have to worry about causation, mitigation, remoteness. You're just asking for the exact sum of money that was somehow ended up in the hands of someone else in a contractual relationship. In fact, the situation where things are paid in error, a non-contractual relationship as well. All right? It's, just, it's a simple remedy that you do to seek to ask for money back. Um, and note that the courts, again, they're a big fan of people being paid. And so restitution is one where if the contract can be chopped up, they will chop it up and order restitution for some components where there's been, again, total failure consideration and where others have been at least partially performed in some way. The courts will chop those contracts up using the divisible contract rules, again, steel and Tariani. All right, so the, essentially, in terms of content, yeah, that's it. It's a bit scary, but um, you've completed your two full semesters of contract law, and that's it. You're not coming back to this. Um, it can sometimes be a little bit scary, but for some of you guys, you, you won't ever revise it. You could end up being practicing, practicing lawyers for 30 years, go and work for the DPP, and you'll never have to deal with um, contracts at all. But um, I can assure you that most people in this room, that's not going to be the case. And the rules and principles you've taken in your two contract law subjects, particularly the second one, are going to be um, valuable. You're going to make them pa more powerful as human beings. You're going to be better at business. You're going to be more valuable to employers. You're going to be more... Um, uh, you're going to have more scope in your own business life as well, either as entrepreneurs, um, as practice owners, um, and wherever else your career um, will take you. So I'll leave it there for the content. And we will carry on with revision, obviously, in the next few weeks. We're a week ahead. And so I um, hope that was useful. I'll close the recording up, and I'll see you all in shoots.